Um, this next session is uh, kind of scares me a little bit with the title, Why Are We Needed in the First Place? But uh, we're, we're going to have the session anyway. Um, just think, if you are a traditional or a conventional microfinance institution, you see mobile banking coming along, you see agent uh, services coming along, you see uh, retail and consumer uh, financing coming along, and your whole operating environment suddenly is becoming a lot more competitive. So this panel is going to try and answer the question, is there a continuing role for conventional microfinance institutions? And what is that role going to be? The panel is moderated by uh, Matthew Bishop. He's the uh, US business editor and the New York bureau chief of the New York, of the New York Times, of The Economist, sorry, of The Economist. He co-founded and advises the uh, hashtag Giving Tuesday campaign and the Social Progress Index. He is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Role of Business. Matthew is a prolific author. He's uh, authored several books, but right now he's busy preparing a report for the G8, uh, a report on the Task Force on Social Impact Investment, and that report is uh, scheduled to be published in September. Um, Panelists, come on out. Matthew, you have the uh, interesting challenge of leading this panel and answering the question, why are we needed in the first place? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, quite a, quite a topic that we've been given this morning. Um, and the panel, let me introduce them first of all. Um, to the, my far right, your far left, is Kamal Kadir, who is the CEO of Bcash. Uh, which is a mobile uh, money service owned by Brack Bank, um, the IFC, and the Gates Foundation, among others, um, and operating in Bangladesh. Uh, to my immediate right is Greta Bull, who is a program manager for the Partnership for Financial Inclusion, um, advisory work at the IFC, and has been uh, very much involved in microcredit, microfinance for probably longer than she'd care to remember. And uh, to my immediate left is Stephen Peachy, who is Program Technical Advisor of the World Savings Bank Institute Facility, um, and very much involved in trying to extend uh, savings banks to the very poor. Um, let me just talk a bit about the context for this discussion. Um, I know I've met a number of you before during the uh, International Year of Microcredit um, back in 2005. Uh, for which I was a member of the advisory group. Um, this was an interesting group that I think reflected the, the general mood of optimism about microcredit and microfinance at the time. The membership of the group spanned a couple of European princesses through to uh, who are now both queens, I think, and, and uh, have retained an interest in microfinance, uh, financial inclusion, uh, all the way across to the head of the, the UNDP and, and Faisal Abed of, of BRAC, um, and was chaired by Stan Fisher, who at the time worked for Citigroup, went on to become the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Israel, and is now deputy governor of the Federal Reserve Bank in the, in the United States. Um, and very much, he, he, he led us in a discussion that was really about how do we get away from the narrow focus on microcredit to really talking about financial inclusion, um, and offering a much broader range of, of financial services. And that was very much the message that the advisors group was putting out through the recommendations that we issued during that year. It was, and it was a lot about how do we change banking regulation to uh, be more open to um, for-profit business models uh, and uh, how do we move away from the reliance on, on philanthropy um, how do we help take cost out of the, out of the system? Um, during the course of that year, I, I was lucky enough to meet Nick Hughes, who at the time was working for Vodafone, on what was seen as a very small pilot project uh, in Kenya, to, um, funded by the Department for International Development from Britain, uh, to experiment with mobile money. Um, I guess that has now gone on to become M-Pesa and, and so forth. At the time, he said, well, it's, it's gone quite well, but I'm not sure we at Vodafone want to become a bank. Um, other telecoms companies may not have had such limited ambitions. Um, since then, I guess, how do we, how do we reflect on, 
on, on where that story about microfinance has gone since then. I do think that there has been a general recognition that focusing on the broader range of microfinance is better than the narrow focus on microcredit. Um, the portfolios of the poor book that Jonathan Murdoch and others uh, produced, I think, was very significant in, in showing that we had to take a broader perspective uh, and really confirming what I think the advisors group had felt back in 2005. Um, we then saw, um, I guess, the, the general discussion around SKS and the IPO in India and, and, and the subsequent fallout from that, which I think in general, if, if, you, if you took the typical member of staff at The Economist, that was probably the last time anyone was really very interested in microfinance, and it, it's allowed a lot of people to say, well, nice idea, but probably uh, not as good as it's cracked up to be. Um, and then the other narrative that's, that, that's really emerged has been uh, that of, of M-Pesa and electric money and mobile money. And, um, and I guess there's a sort of general sense that M-Pesa has been a great success, but rather puzzling that it's not spread very much to other countries. And I think probably that externally is, you know, what the, what the narrative is around microfinance. And if you, if you looked at people who are in the development field now, um, they're much more interested potentially in whether impact investing as a rather broader category um, is, uh, is the thing to get excited about if you're a queen or princess nowadays. And, um, you know, whether, um, and, I, and I guess certainly as I'm trying to write this report for the G, for what was the G8 task force and is now a task force started by what was the G8, um, is, uh, I mean, as we sit and write that report, um, you know, actually trying to get any reference to microfinance at all in it, even though I think it's seen as the pioneering impact investment, is actually proving quite a, quite a struggle because people don't want to associate with something that's seen to be uh, you know, somewhat tainted as a brand. So that, by way of context, is kind of, you know, a, a, a sense of the last 10 years and where we have come to from a perspective of people who are not deeply in the field. And so I think my first round of, of, of questions would be sort of, to, to, would be to ask our panelists, how do they view that narrative as to where we've come over the last 10 years and where we are today? And then I'm going to have a second round of, of comments, which is, uh, which is going to be about, okay, so a lot's happened in the past 10 years. Let, let us try and think about what the narratives ought to be over the next 10 years and to what extent do traditional microfinance institutions have a role to play? Um, and if so, what should that be? And I'm going to start, I think, with, uh, with Greta. Okay. Kick us off with the last 10 years and where we are today. Gosh, the last 10 years. Okay. Is this, is this working? It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, Bob asked me to be on this panel because I work not only in microfinance quite extensively, but also we, we do a lot of work with MNOs, with payment services providers. I've done this in both Latin America and Africa, which gives very contrasting views of, of how the ecosystem is developing. And I think, you know, coming to Africa um, about three years ago, everybody's very excited about M-Pesa and what Safaricom has done. Um, and I think we've all sort of used that as our, our bellwether in terms of where we're taking the industry um, and what's possible to do in the industry. But I think um, while Safaricom and M-Pesa gave us an insight, I don't necessarily think it gave us a template. And I think a lot of us have made the mistake over the last few years of thinking that we just have to do exactly what they did in Kenya and then it will magically work in Nigeria. Um, and, and I think the last three years has proven that that's actually not the case. Um, and so as, as somebody who is actually very um, committed to microfinance, we've been very involved in the microfinance space. And when we started our program with the MasterCard Foundation, a lot of people said to me, why are you doing this with microfinance institutions? They're not going to be the next M-Pesa. They're not big enough to be the next M-Pesa. Um, and we felt like actually the microfinance community is really important in this in this scenario. Th this is an ecosystem that's evolving, right? So M-Pesa built one thing. There's some other things evolving. And, and it's more... Um, an ecosystem with multiple players. So microfinance institutions certainly have an important role to play in this, but so do so do the Coco Copos of this world who are doing um, merchant payments. Sorry. 
Um, so do the distributors of, of services over the wires. I mean, it, it's an infrastructure that people can deliver financial services on, and that's really the important insight. So using the twin pillars of technology and fundamentally distribution, that's a really important part of the, the topic right now. How do you get financial services and products like electricity into the hands of the poor that enable them to grow and um, better their lives? Um, so we think actually all sorts of different players are important in this ecosystem, all have a different role to play and all offer services in a different way. So we th we're really excited about the possibilities of what MPES has sort of put on the, on the table, but I think it's going to evolve in really weird and wonderful ways and we can talk about that more. Mm -hmm. Stephen. We'll try yeah. your mic first, it may work. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, look, uh, I'll be honest, the last 10 years of, uh, the last few years rocked us back, but you know, to borrow this morning's analogy, you know, we can either go sideways down or the only way is up. Our program is calling, called Doubling Savings Accounts in the Hands of the Poor. Um, it's not been easy. We've been running it for six years with Gates Foundation money. Um, we traditional, actually nine out of the 10 projects are with traditional postal savings banks. They're not the fastest movers in the world. But actually we've just broken through our doubling savings accounts uh, benchmark. And we've actually had to renew the entire customer base. We have recruited half a million customers in Kenya to keep half a million customers. But they are now all, almost 90% unambiguously in the uh, target market. I think one thing, if you want to call yourself a double bottom line institution, and you still need to make a profit because it's the only way uh, we ever get capital, um, then, but you want to deliver something socially useful, it, it's now the extreme poor that we have to aim for. There is no point pretending that the market can't resolve the needs of the moderately poor or the near poor in low-income countries. Slightly different in middle-income countries, there's a lot of unbanked low-income households that are above the poverty line. But in the low-income countries, we really have to uh, aim at the extreme poor. That means people not on $1.25 a day, those are PPP dollars, it's people on 50 cents to a dollar. And where the real need is, is out in the rural areas, uh, and that's 50 cents a day. So if you want to take 50 cents as a fee from someone, you're actually asking to take an entire day's living from them. So you have to use the technology, and you have to use the partners uh, to make a service work at 50 cents a day. But it, it does put the M-PESA experience in context. End-to-end, -to, -end, to send money and cash out, is 50 cents. It's a once-a-month luxury purchase for the median Kenyan. It's not a daily thing. F to do savings, we clearly have to be able to collect really small amounts of money uh, at really high frequency daily. So we're going out into the villages and partnering with village-level savings and loan groups. We're not terribly good yet at partnering with other formal players, but we are doing really well out in the village with village level savings and loans groups, and we're actually rebuilding our mobile banking offer entirely around the way they work. Now, just to pick up on your, your point that you feel the last 10 years have been sort of sideways or maybe a bit backwards or there's been some stalling. For the savings bank movement. For the yeah. savings bank movement in particular. Yeah. Um, why did that happen, do you think? I think we stuck with a traditional product and we thought we were modernizing just by turning, you know, turning the passbook into a card account. And we weren't really doing the human-centered design. We weren't looking at the way people actually save money in the villages. Our competition is not other banks. We, we, we have to leave that behind. We have to, our competition is informal and cash. Someone said it yesterday, actually. I think it was Strike said it yesterday. The, the, you know, the competition is cash. We have to look at the way people handle cash, move it around. 70% of the money in a Kenyan village moves within a kilometre. 80% of the transactions, but what shocked me is it's 70% of the money is within one kilometre. Now, 
You can't move that on mobile money. We have to find some way of letting people move that around, maybe by touching phones, uh, that works for transactions that are under a dollar. So we, we've literally been just sitting in the villages uh, with our partners from the VSLA movement, just trying to learn now how people save money, how they get those little surpluses that they put aside and when they pull them back out. Now, Greta, again, I mean, just how you would characterize the last 10 years, I mean, do you feel that there, have been, there has been a stalling of uh, the development of the microfinance industry relative to, you know, obviously the excitement that we've seen about the telecoms uh, sector where the mobile phone has really, you know, quite to everyone's surprise, really become the, the driver of so much positive development activity? So I, I think the microfinance industry has continued to develop mm -hmm. um, and it's continued to mature and I think there, there was sort of a sense that, that we needed to become full service banks and do the necessary transformation that would enable that. But I do think the whole M-Pesa story has been incredibly disruptive. But this was an, in an industry in need of disruption. And that's not just microfinance, it's the banking industry as well. Um, and in some ways, banks have been slower to the table than microfinance institutions. I think, um, and, and actually the numbers really show it. So if you take the case of um, Kenya and Tanzania, what M-Pesa and mobile money have done the, in these markets is remarkable, not only for what it's done in terms of for formal financial services, but for what it's done in the banking system. So in Kenya, from 2006 to 2013, you went from 27% of the population having access to any formal financial service to 67%. But the more incredible shift is that f in terms of access to bank accounts, it went from 13% to 29%, which is a massive shift from it, for an industry that's been sitting there for 100 years and not offering offering bank accounts to most of the population. And, you know, we're all a little tired of talking about the Kenya story, so let's look at Tanzania. In Tanzania, the story is exactly the same. And since 2009, we've gone from 16% of the population having access to 58%, and the banking system shifted from 10 to 14%. So, you know, the microfinance in industry is waking up to this. They're understanding that they need to change. It is a huge cultural shift. So we work, for example, with Finca in the DRC. They are the biggest institution, financial institution in the DRC in terms of customer numbers, but they could be so much bigger. And, and the conversation we're having with them, having helped double their customer base in the last year, is how do we take it to a million clients and more? But the cultural change in that institution is so profound. You, you know, you have to sort of build the tracks, um, moving at top speed while hoping that the wheels don't fall off, right? So it's really helping build the institutional foundation that, that enables the kind of growth that we haven't seen so much in microfinance with a few exceptions. Now, Kamal, I wanted to bring you in. I mean, you're, you're the disruptor. Um, you are not a, a microfinance guy, but you've come in um, and built up 30 million customers for your, your mobile money in, uh, in Bangladesh. Now, how do you, first of all, how do you respond to this history of the past 10 years from the perspective of you know, providing financial services to the poor and extending financial inclusion. What, 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 what are your reactions to what you've heard as a telecoms guy who's, who's a, achieving some success with poorer customers? Well, thanks for um, your introduction. That, uh, in fact, uh, I was thinking of referring to a uh, conversation I had with Bob last year when I got a call and I said, I don't know much about microfinance. And he said, well, that's why we ask you to come. So, uh, um, and in, in last one year, it has not um, improved much about my understanding of microfinance. But, um, <laughs> but uh, what I would tell you is that uh, the customer are, are ready okay, to adopt new tools. And, and if we, um, to give little um, um, history of or where because how does Bikar start? Uh, what we looked at is in Bangladesh uh, to start a um, to start to provide any basic service through a bank, whether to give a leaflet to somebody or to you know in cash a check. It cost one dollar sixty cents, and then the average ticket size is around uh, uh, what Bikar is, is experiencing is around uh, eleven dollar. 
So when your customer's ticket size is $11 and bank cost uh, $1.60, there is no way uh, you can serve the customer uh, with the existing infrastructure, banking infrastructure. So fundamentally what we have done, we have taken that to the retail level. Okay? So a shop uh, with um, uh, basic mom and pop um, store, um, grocery, medicine, airtime, um, tobacco, there they have financial uh, services now. So, uh, and we do around 40 million transactions per month. So, uh, um, so what it allows that people can send money from one part to another part, people can make the repayment uh, of any loan, uh, any small purchase, but what we need to also, and coming from Bangladesh, uh, and uh, I heard in another uh, event like this is that microfinance's official language is Bengali. Okay, so um, so there is a um, um, what I what I do learn from my colleagues from BRAC and, and other institutions that microfinance is not just about giving money and you know taking the money back. Uh, there's lots of coaching is involved, lots of human intervention is involved. Okay, so uh, if those interventions can be properly designed with the tool that is available today, I think a lot of things are possible. Okay. But yeah, I mean, um, I, I was hearing um, um, Geta mentioning about uh, people having energy, uh, combining mobile money, um, for example, um, um, uh, MCOPA in Kenya. So if, if there is a very cleverly, uh, it could be designed, thinking about the customer and the client, uh, this kind of tool could be very much, um, uh, it could be used very effectively. Um, there is this uh, massive debate about telco-led and bank-led kind of things, but as a smartphone uh, uh, penetrates into, uh, into um, um, you know, common people's hands, uh, that debate will, will disappear gradually. Okay. Well, let, me, let me just uh, jump in on that because I think that debate is something I'd love to get your perspective on because I, mean, I can think back a few years and there was this sort of general frustration. I remember talking to, interviewing Bill Gates about this, and he just couldn't understand why his M-Pesa working in, you know, in Kenya and not working, not taking off anywhere else. And, and the answer seemed to be something to do with the lack of competition to the providers in Kenya, allowed it to do some stuff that um, maybe you couldn't do in more competitive telecom markets elsewhere. Um, and now you, you've, you've achieved some traction with a different model. Tanzania is somewhat different. What, what are we learning about, I mean, uh, about what it takes to get mobile money to, to really grow in a country? Right. right. I, I, think, I think it's a, it's a um, um, you know, I mean, SIGAP did a study that um, I think 197 uh, mobile money initiative took place in the last seven, eight years, mm -hmm. and very few of them went beyond 200,000. I think regulation is the key, mm -hmm. is, is very clearly laying out the stakeholders and their roles are very important. Uh, in developing countries where other um, basic um, um, element that we expect in, 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 in developed economy to work very smoothly, whether that is KYC, whether that is a social security number, there are challenging uh, situations that we, we work under. So there, uh, if, we, if we do not take the regulatory part seriously, okay, uh, it becomes quite, quite difficult to function. So if we have the regulations very clearly laid out, that happened in Bangladesh. Uh, Central Bank, for example, it took a very clear and bold position there, uh, defining the role of the financial regulator, the role of the network provider, and customer, and, and, and eventually the service provider. Okay? And when those stakeholders mapping is done clearly, and if the players are adequately rewarding each other, okay, a fantastic ecosystem can, can develop. Okay? In Bangladesh, uh, we have 80% of our revenue goes to the agents and the distributors, who takes tremendous uh, risk in the market. 7% um, of our top line revenue goes to the mobile operator, and 13% stays with the service providers. From there, we are providing um, you know, all our costs. So that kind of economic model um, can provide adequate incentive for everybody. And that's when the, the, the ecosystem will grow. I mean, one element we, we often miss is the customer, the clients, where this discussion is so much focused. Clients in Bangladesh, I mean, we were doing a math yesterday. 
100 million mobile phone users. Each handset on average cost $30. So clients have invested $3 billion uh, just buying the handsets. We need to give the clients a choice that where they will go and how they will go it rather than boxing them into different pieces. Okay? So I think, I think if we can have a very clear regulation, uh, that is, 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 I think, is the key. And just to add with this point that this regulatory part, whenever we talk in a free economy, we immediately get a bit, you know, itchy, uh, you know, a bit allergic about the whole thing. But I think, I think it's, it's, you know, while we need to see things from the bird's eye view, but we also need to see from the warm side view of the reality where we are operating and, and what challenges we face there. And that's why regulatory is very critical. So, Greta, let's try and now roll forward and say, well, what, what should we be aiming for for the next 10 years? What, what, what's, you know, what, what, can, what could be achieved? What need to be the priorities? What, you know, should this be MFI-led? Should it be telco-led? Is there some happy marriage between the two? Well, I, I'd like to jump in on the... You know, I think it, it'll come on, yeah. um, I, I'd like to jump in on the regulatory point because I think that's actually critical for the future as well. I, I agree completely that getting the regulation right is important, and it's important in a couple of ways. Getting it right today and getting it right going forward makes a big difference, and, and it's sort of a Goldilocks thing, right? You can have too much regulation. If I take the case of Nigeria, it's over-regulated. It's stagnating the market. If I take the case of Kenya, some would argue that it's under-regulated and you have a monopoly that's not behaving in a very competitive fashion. Well, when we talk about regulation, I, mean, I guess immediately it's the question of that there's two regulators at least. You've got the financial at regulator least. and the telco regulator, and I guess in Nigeria they don't really talk and, and so Yeah, forth. well, and there's the competition authority yeah. and various. And, and yeah. you know, I, I go back to my days in Peru in microfinance, and I think in a way Peru has the ideal kind of regulatory framework because it's full of information. They've got a regulator that listens to industry, they adjust as they go along, and, and it's an evolution. Um, and so regulators need to sort of get the starting point right today, because what, what you really want is an ecosystem that, that is open, interoperable, has an even playing field for all players, is competitive and therefore low cost, you have multiple players who can engage, and, and a smart regulator will um, listen to industry and will make sensible decisions on behalf of consumers. And it, then you can start, you know, once you get the beginning point right, you can start tackling issues like interoperability, which I think are critical going forward. As and when it's appropriate to do that, you engage with industry and you can make the, the regulatory framework m add up and make sense for all the different players in the ecosystem because it is an ecosystem and it involves multiple partners. And if partners are coming at this trying to eat each other's lunch because the regulatory framework encourages that almost, then you get nowhere. So what's the goal for the next 10 years? So where, where do you see this going? For the industry? Yeah. I, what I said, I mean, I think really um, competitive, even playing field, lots of different people can plug into an ecosystem. We talked yesterday a little bit about how actually the agent network and the tech are almost rails that you run everything else on. I, I, I agree with that, and I think there are certain utility functions, for example, on the interoperable side, switches and, and schemes that allow for multilateral payment agreements. Um, this is the infrastructure on which other services can run. So you get, you know, the MCOPA in um, Kenya because you have that infrastructure in place. Um, in other markets, we don't have that distribution infrastructure yet. So I think regulators in particular need, need to think about how you develop that infrastructure before they figure out what services you can run over it. And I mean, I guess it's often, you know, the, the process of financial inclusion is often seen as just lowering the the ceiling, in a sense, to, to include more and more of the people, lower down the income structure. I mean, to what extent is that is just continuing to lower uh, the strategy, or should we be really targeting the very bottom of the pyramid and more, more aggressively? Well, I might take a slightly different view from Stephen on this, but I, I mean, I think what you need to do is, I, we work with commercial entities in IFC, and I think what we're trying to do is, um, as Mark Flaming said the other day, is, is help the microfinance industry understand how they can become a mass market industry, providing banking services for the mass market. And so that's not about just credit, that's about transforming your institution so you can provide multiple services as a bank. But then it is really lowering the, the level that you serve at. Some will go to the bottom of the pyramid, others will just sort of gradually go down. But I think the beauty about the technology and distribution that we're seeing right now is it really does lower the entry barriers to serving that population and it does make it 
actually feasible. So again, as Mark was saying, you know, he reached, it, particularly in Africa where it's very rural, you reach the limits of branch infrastructure very, very quickly. And so agency and mobile banking, you know, it doesn't have to be in pesos, it can be from a bank perspective. You can serve those lower income customers cost effectively by using those sorts of technologies. Stephen. Yeah. Um, l let me come back immediately. The reason I say I think for the double bottom line institutions it's going uh, for the um, extreme poor is they are the bottom half of the market in low income Africa. It's different in middle income countries. Um, but I love the way Kamal talks when he's talking about mobile money. I don't necessarily love some of the other experiences I have. Um, I think the future, uh, and Rita said this right at the beginning, I think there was a phrase, dare to trust. I'm going to have, we're going to have to move to a stage where we start sharing our business models with partners. And actually, <laughs> the double bottom line thing is not about parceling out one bottom line, it's about arbitraging the different profit functions. There are things that I can do for village groups that cost me virtually nothing. Village groups can do KYC at a cost that I just can't imagine. It's so tiny. They can bring me customers ready to be KYC'd in bulk. Um, my Let's know your customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, know your customer. My version of Leon's badge all the time is to wear um, uh, the frontline T-shirt of the members we work with. And guys, I hope you can get the back of this. This is grow the numbers through village banking. Now, our Ugandan member Are you said selling this, copies of the T-shirt? Uh, uh, no, this is a special edition. Oh, wow. I think this is a, this is a two-finger salute T-shirt right. because our Ugandan member had been telling us they wanted to do linkage banking into the villages. We, I fought them to a standstill over two years because on an $800,000 investment because we couldn't agree the conditional future tense about activities and inputs and outcomes. Couldn't, we just couldn't make a language work. So we gave them 160000 I went to Ian Radcliffe, the program director. I said, for 160000 we can't even afford an airfare. There's certainly no consultancy input. We just give them the money. We tell them, spend it on village uh, level uh, banking initiatives. And when they've got a certain number of customers, 85,000, they can come back. This T-shirt is to celebrate the fact that they've gone from 50,000 poor customers to 125,000. So they've done 90% of the target a year ahead. So we've given them the next tranche. I don't know whether it's a two-finger victory salute or it's the other way round to sort of, fuck you, peachy, you know. Mm. Mm. Why didn't you just let us have our head? Mm. But it's worked because they've taken their mobile banking product, but they've rebuilt it around the way the village groups work. Mm. They, we have now funded um, the software so that all of the village groups that they work with, and these are 100,000 members of these groups who are not all yet connected with the bank, will, will have an electronic sub-account. When they have an electronic sub-account, first of all, there's a parallel electronic audit trail. If something goes wrong with the paper trail, we too will, will have a record. We have auditors in the bank. They're sitting there. They're a fixed cost. We can offer it as a service. We're not going to charge for the electronic account holding. Um, what we will do is link, allow people, and half of them, we reckon, are already signing up for the bank account, to transfer money between uh, their bank account and their electronic sub-account. Now, the next step is to say, OK, rather than message and validate every transaction, if someone puts too much cash into their village sub-account, it's a behavioral hint that they might want the money to go into their bank account. If someone puts too much e-value into the electronic sub-account, it might mean, I would like cash out in the village, please. That way, we're absolutely minimizing the cost of messaging to a level where we can offer it that single sense. And that, you know, suddenly takes 
the mobile banking, mobile money product right out into the villages. Because only, only about 30-40% of Ugandans are within, are rural Ugandans, are within, within two or three kilometers of a mobile money outlet. So we can't just do it with mobile money. We have to take the technology and get it into the villages in a way that works at single cents. And we have to say, if you want to put it onto your mobile money account, that's fine. You know, it's an electronic transfer. I've basically, electronic transfers cost me nothing. So, Kamal, uh, give us, I mean, obviously, if we look at the last 10 years, you know, the evolution of the mobile phone has just, you know, gone much faster than many people would have imagined. And, and, and it, the sense in which it's, you know, transforming the lives of the very poor is also, you know, a very surprising development. Where do you see now, you know, bearing in mind that it's very hard to predict the future, um, what do you see as being the next phase of evolution in terms of what's going to be possible in terms of mobile money uh, for, uh, you know, for, particularly for the mass market and the bottom of the pyramid? Well, um, uh, Matthew, whatever we predict will be proven wrong. Yeah. So, um, um, <laughs> so uh, I'll put it this way. I mean, I, I, I live and work in Bangladesh and uh, mobile phone is perhaps the most powerful democratizing tool uh, you know, we have witnessed or mankind has witnessed in last 100, 200 years. It's so powerful and everybody can afford it. Um, I, think, I think what, I'll, I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. um, from, from my operation. So because we are a telco agnostic uh, financial institution um, uh, regulated by Central Bank, we initiated our service with pure financial service, namely cash in, cash out, people deposit, people take, get interest, people um, make payment. Okay. And after two years of our, two and a half years of our operation, we first launch airtime. So we basically, on top of our system, we put another layer. In three weeks, we reached around 400,000 transactions per day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what it says, that if the technology platform can handle it, people are ready for different things. Okay. And so what's going to happen? So is, is, are we going to see a lot more so, sophistication so, in the phone? Yeah, so, the so I think, I think um, if we can design the product properly, and I think proper product designing is the key here, so if you want to reach the certain segment, whether it's microfinance or microinsurance, if we can design it properly, uh, then uh, people will adopt it for, uh, it's a new tool, it's a new channel for more efficient distribution of, of income, um, wealth and whatever you call it. I, I while I um, appreciate it very much, but when people call uh, M-Pesa or Bcash financial inclusion, I think it's an overkill, okay? Because we are uh, basically a tool that could be used for real financial inclusion where loan could be available for people, resource could be available for people, okay? Uh, but what I can also uh, add is that what is happening, something superb exciting that I haven't even thought about because uh, I have limited thinking capacity, uh, is that, is that uh, when we were thinking about Bcash after seeing the tremendous uh, innovation at M-Pesa, uh, we thought this is great, this could happen in Bangladesh, so why would not Bangladesh experience this thing? Precisely that kind of mindset pushed us for this kind of uh, initiative. Um, Poor people started using it. And the, the combined float today is a significant amount of money, which is being used for other capital uh, opportunity. I mean, Bragg Bank is investing in, in, in probably in hospital, in, in industries, creating jobs, creating schools. That kind of possibility that very poor people putting 50 cents, taking 50 cents out in the process, creating a massive pool and creating a national opportunity for poor people to directly participate in a macroeconomic uh, activity, I think that is a very exciting thing, okay? So that kind of lot of exciting initiative can take place where very, very, very small um, deposit, very poor people can directly participate in, in real activities, real macroeconomic uh, action. And that I think is, there are many such possibilities can develop 
uh, and my uh, the the airtime example I just mentioned is is a is just a evidence of how quickly people will adopt it. So I mean, there's this question that's being raised of whether you know we should really be looking for the the mission-driven MFI industry to be driving this, this innovation, or is it going to be telco-led? And you know, I, I, there's examples, obviously, of telcom, telco companies using microinsurance as a sort of loyalty program and so forth in parts of Africa. I mean, what do you think? It, what, what needs to happen? Is, is this something where this industry can really I mean, play the leading role, or is it really going to be a I think yesterday when I, when I heard uh, Echo Cash speaking, mm -hmm. uh, the scenario he was describing uh, I think it's 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 quite unique, and in such scenario, I think I think telephone company can make tremendous intervention, okay, um, and, and that's going to add value to society. society. But con country like Bangladesh, uh, 250 billion dollar economy with a very robust regulation, will have probably regulator will have a different kind of role. So I think um, place to place, country to country, it can vary. Uh, we have learned a lot from M-Pesa. Uh, I think I think. Um, learning from everybody and applying and designing something that is uniquely fitting for each ecology, I think is the key. Yeah. I'd like to come in there because this is also not just a low income country issue either. Middle income countries need some of this as well. Uh, we were a bit slow on M-Pesa as the aha moment, for, but Umshwari definitely is an aha moment uh, for us. Uh, because saving is now the electronic squirt at the end of the phone, and people can do it literally whenever and, and however they want in what amount. But it's waking us up. Uh, we have a Colombian member here in the audience. They've come up with a fantastic uh, daily or sort of version of the regular savings plan, deliberately stripped down uh, and linked to mobile in a way that will um, work at the very edge of poverty uh, in Colombia. And there's a lot of unbanked low-income households that don't count as poor, but you know are relatively poor. It is definitely waking us up. And I don't think it's an either-or moment. You know, like, just like yesterday's debate about high-touch, low-touch, it it's not a pure binary choice. But the poor will not forgive us for sort of trying to fight the mobile money industry to a standstill. What they want us to do is to use the rail. And uh, Greta, I mean, you could make the case that actually it's in the telco's interest to, to make these services available, so, so maybe MFIs will be redundant. What, what, what's your reaction to that? I think we have to get, a, get away from this idea of telco-led or bank-led. I mean, mm. that's gone. Uh, there are lots of different people building this kind of infrastructure, and, and the card companies are coming into yeah. this space now. So there are multiple players, PSPs, payment services providers, are also building important agent yeah. networks that provide the distribution that you need to support the technology. So I, I think um, anybody can play. It's an ecosystem and anybody can play. And if you look at the structure of Africa, yes, MNOs have played a leading role. If you look at Latin America, MNOs yeah. are late to the game. They're really not doing that much in Latin America, so the banks are doing a lot more. I, so I think we have to stop thinking about it either or I completely agree with Stephen. And I think really, People in this industry, the access to finance industry, have to look at this as a huge opportunity. Whether you're an MFI, whether you want to deliver, you know, electric solar chargers to people in rural areas, this is an opportunity for you. But you have to wake up and figure out how you operate in this ecosystem sensibly today. And so th that, to me, is the real challenge to the industry because the industry has not grown as fast as any of us would like on the microfinance side. But now there is a real opportunity to really grow quickly and, and provide services to people further and further down the bottom. The and, how, and how much does a sense of mission matter in, in, in the next 10 years? I think sense of mission matters, but you know, in the conversation, for example, that we're having with Finca in terms of how they're evolving and, and really transforming, to me, you know, we have to get away from where we started. You know, we give microcredit to people, poor people, because it's a good thing to do. I think really, it's know your customer in a different way. It's not KYC, it's know your customers, follow your customers, give them what they want. There is, as you were saying, there's a lot of economic value at the bottom of the pyramid. It's just very disparate and frag fragmented, but there's the same demand for convenience, the same demand for services. And if you understand what your customers want and follow them, you really can't go too wrong. 
Uh, this, the money is huge. We've worked out in the 10 countries we're in, we have 300 million unbanked, 300 million poor. The overlap is 250 million. They are living on $5 billion a week. I've got some countries in the portfolio where if I could just keep that money for three days, I would double the institution's balance sheet. It's not an either or on profit. <laughs> you know, it's, it really is a double bottom line. Well, unfortunately, I mean, our time is pretty much up. I, I, I could go on for, for a lot longer um, because there's so many questions. But I just wanted to ask each of you, uh, just if you had to identify one priority to focus on over the next year, one, one development that you think, if, if that happens next year, you know, we're really moving in the right direction to dramatically expanding financial inclusion, you know, what would that one thing be? I'll start with you. Come well, um, uh, I mean, Matthew, I'm going to need a little more than 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. So the issue would be product designing. And here I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I met one of my uh, customer. Uh, she was cashing out only 500 taka, which is less than six dollars in in Bangladesh. And 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 I asked her, "What are you going to do with this?" She just said, "I'm going to do grocery." And they said, "How is Bikash?" I just asked her, and obviously she doesn't know what I do. And she said, "It's good, but too good is not good." And then she walks away. And I started following her, and I said, "What do you really mean?" And then she says, like, you know, my husband and my son uh, are rickshaw pullers. They work in, in, in Dhaka, in the city. And, and every, in the past, every two weeks, they used to come and visit me. Okay. And now they send the money, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> and it really made me yeah. see the whole thing totally differently, is that here we are thinking of solving uh, this problem. We are working, we are, you know, we are addressing this issue in, and try to have the product designing as good as possible to serve the client, and we fail. So, um, um, so again, there are many millions of positive stories, but there are some stories like this as well, which made us think that how critical product designing is. So you would like to see what, more emphasis on? More, more emphasis on exactly what, segmenting clearly, whom are you trying to serve, and how you're serving this customer, and, and, and are we really meeting the, at the end goal Okay, uh, and as this lady was telling me that, yes, she's happy, it's good, but it has caused some other problem, okay. Mm. And, and, and it's very important that to be sensitive about uh, designing the product in the right way, whether through regulatory help, whether through uh, ma, ma, proper commercial design between telephone company and the bank, or with the distributor. Um, but at the end of the day, it's very important to understand what does your client really want. Greta, one priority. Gosh, there are so many priorities in this industry. Um, I, I think it, um, obviously knowing your customers and following your customers is a really important part of it. But for me, the big struggle in the upcoming year is around business models. I think a lot of people are struggling with business models in this, and that is true for M&Os, large banks, microfinance institutions. We have to build much more robust platforms to be able to do this. This is a scale business. And you have to have good systems in place. I mean, Strive was saying this yesterday. You know, it, it's almost scary how fast they grow. You have to have the systems in place to be able to reach people. And you know, there's a lot of talk in the industry, for example, about big data. Can we start with small data, please? Um, yeah. Most of our customers actually don't know what they've got in their core banking systems or in their, in their you know, data systems. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding what we've all got to begin with. Great. And last yeah. word for you, I, Stephen. I have a very parochial one. We, we know from our work on business model that we need about a million active customers uh, to amortize the IT systems. Do they have to be our customers? If in a year's time I had one member who was actually hosting other people's customers uh, and they had they'd worked out some trust mechanism in term, because they're not our customers or your customers or, you know, they're their own people. It's not a form of financial bondage just to access your own money. Uh, if I could persuade one member to actually host another microfinance institution in the way that we're partnering informal. Because I really, you know, we've got to stop squabbling with each other because, you know, there's, even in Kenya, there are more new adults coming into the population than are being banked. So we're not. And what would that, ho the, part, the hosting mean well, in practice? You know, there what there might be a microfinance institution that does credit that we're never going to do. 
uh, and also wants to take a particular kind of savings. Maybe we take the sort of in-out savings and they take the, the kind of savings they want. Or maybe they just want funding and we take the savings in a, to a nice protected savings account and give them wholesale funding. It's that kind of sharing the profit function. This is what I can do uh, for you, but that, this is what I need to make this model work. Because if we're out in the villages, then you know, that's value. Great. Well, I'd like to thank the panel for a very stimulating conversation. It seems to me um, you know, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic over the next 10 years, but you know, I very much feel one of the lessons that we should take from the last 10 years, and this applies, I think, broadly to this whole field of impact investing as well of, as, as financial inclusion, is that we do need to retain a sense of mission because actually you know, extending markets to, to, to poorer people you know, it does require sensitivity and cust knowing your customer, but also helping to educate customers so they don't make the mistakes that we know people make when they often get the first chance to, 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 to experience mar the life of the market. And so I do hope it's not just going to be telco-led and bank-led, but we'll, there will be a very vibrant role for, for people who've really been driven by the sense of mission uh, to come into this field. And I hope that... Uh, in 10 years' time, we're sitting back and really saying we, we've delivered on, on that great promise. So thank you very much to the panel for an inspiring conversation.